Hello, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, uh, after my manure pit experience, it's good to be anywhere. I'll just uh, briefly share my story. Um, I was born October 30th, 1957, the middle of eight children born to Leonard and Anna Nelson. Uh, we had a dairy operation and as a little kid, all I ever wanted to do was to become a dairy farmer like my dad. I was given the opportunity to start farming on my own shortly after high school. I rented some land south of Brookings and uh, began dairy farming there. And that's where I was living when I met my wife and our oldest son was born. In 1983, uh, my landlord came to me and said, you're gonna have to find a different place to live because we're gonna turn your farm into houses. So uh, I looked for a place to buy and we couldn't find anything. So dad and I hit upon this idea of uh, joining our herds together and building a hundred cow dairy operation on his farm. So that's what we did. We built a hundred cow dairy operation and we began milking cows. Um, everybody in their life has a particular date that they'll remember. Uh, for me, one of those that stands out is uh, July 10th, 1988, uh, because that was the day that I was supposed to die. Now, it was a hot summer Sunday, and the plan was for me and my wife to meet at the Folk Arts Festival in Brookings and spend some time with our two young sons and, and uh, enjoy some of the crafts and the food. Uh, so I was rushing through chores and pushing manure into our manure pit. Uh, now, Dad and I had designed the barn with an underground manure pit on the southwest corner of the barn. And this pit is uh, 12 feet deep by eight by 16. And uh, the idea is that we would push the manure in there and, and mix it up with the wastewater from the dairy and, and pump it into a lagoon for long-term storage. Uh, so I was pushing in manure and I noticed that the pump had plugged. You know, the pump could handle a certain amount of waste hay and straw, but obviously too much had gotten in there. And this had happened before. And there were two ways to unplug that pump. Uh, the right way, of course, was to pull the pump out. And that took a couple of men and a couple of hours to do that and, and to put the pump back in. And then there was the quick and dirty way, which I had done dozens of times. The quick and dirty way was you crawled into the pit and you used a spud bar to unplug the nozzle. So that's what I decided to do. I uh, pumped the manure down a little bit and I climbed down into the pit and I bent over with the spud bar in my hand, and I began to feel really weird. And I thought to myself, it's the gas. I'd heard about some kind of gas in the nerve pits, but I didn't really know what it was. And so I left the spud bar and I began to climb out of the pit and I nearly made it. I was almost to the top. I could see the blue sky and hear the old 4020 idling and when everything just faded to black, like at the end of an old movie. What had happened is I had dipped my head into a puddle of hydrogen sulfide and inhaled. As you probably know, hydrogen sulfide is one of the most dangerous gases known to mankind. Uh, in high enough concentrations, one lungful can kill you literally instantly. Well, my parents noticed that the tractor was still sitting there, so they went down to investigate. My dad found me uh, floating face up in the manure. so. He ran to the house and made that 911 call that no parent would ever want to make. And they rushed back down to the barn and they set up an old box fan to try to blow some fresh air in on me while they waited for the rescuers to come. And so, of course, the first responders came and they had to put on self-contained breathing apparatus and go down in the pit and fish me out. And they said that when they got me out that they couldn't find any pulse and that I wasn't breathing. And of course, I was also soaked with manure, so somebody called for a bucket of water, which they got out of the cattle fountain, and they threw it on me, and I moved a little bit, and they thought, oh boy, he's alive. So uh, they worked on me and got me stabilized and took me to the Brookings Hospital. Now, my wife, in the meantime, this was before cell phones, so she, we had no way to get in touch with her, and she thought that I decided to just work all day. And so she'd gone to the Hy-Vee to get some groceries, and she was leaving the parking lot when this car whipped up beside her really fast and it was one of the first responders and he rolled down his window and yelled at my wife get to the hospital Jerry's still breathing and that's how she was introduced to this whole thing so she rushed to the hospital and uh, talked to the medical people there and um, they said that Jerry has suffered a very severe injury to his lungs he's likely to die here quite soon 
And my wife said, is he still alive? And the doctor said, well, yes, but you know, it doesn't look good. She said, well, call the chopper, get him to Sioux Falls. And the doctor says, you don't understand, there is no hope. Uh, but she said, I don't care, call the chopper. So a helicopter was called and I was taken to the Sioux Falls Hospital where I was worked on for a while. And, and I, they found out I had a collapsed lung and I'd probably inhaled some manure. And you know how it is, you want to get uh, a number put on things. So my wife asked them, what are his odds? And they said, well, he's very, very ill. And if he makes it through the next seven days after that, maybe we'll give him a 50-50 chance. So I was put on a respirator and uh, my wife said that I would spike fevers as high as 106. Um, and she would go in there and, and try to clean me off. And she said afterwards her, her face and the wash rag would smell like rotten eggs, which was the hydrogen sulfide sweating out of my body. And after I'd been there about a week, uh, my wife came to see me one day and I mouthed to her, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And so she summoned the doctors and they examined me and they said, well, you know how when you bang your knee and your knee swells, well, Jerry's lungs ha are swelling because of the great injury they've sustained. And, and this is it, you better call the family. He's not gonna live much longer. My wife yet again kept her wits about her and said, do you think there's anything Mayo Clinic could do? And the doctor said, well, we'll call them and ask. So they called Mayo Clinic and Mayo Clinic said, well, he would never survive an air flight over to Rochester, but why don't you go in with an endoscope and see what's going on? And so they went down with an endoscope and they found blood clots, some of which were uh, half the size of the doctor's thumb that were plugging some of my bronchial tubes and they pulled them out and then I could breathe better. Now, from my point of view, uh, the first three weeks are, were just a, a blur of uh, reality blended with some hallucinations. Uh, uh, I was put on all the good drugs. By the time it was over, I was addicted to morphine. But gradually, my lung function returned, and they could wean me off the drugs. And slowly, it, I realized that I was in the hospital. And I, I knew two things. One was that I didn't belong there, and the other is that I had some farming to do. So. I tried to get out of the bed. I leaned forward and something popped away from my neck and it was my respirator, which was hooked up to my tracheostomy and, and the, uh, the respirator whooped and a nurse came running in and pushed me down and hooked me back up to the respirator and said, you be good. Do you want me to tie you back down again? I thought, what does she mean again? Well, I'd been a bad boy. There has been several times I had to restrain me. And it's, it slowly dawned on me as I laid there that uh, I could maybe stay like this forever. I had no idea what was going on. My wife came in and explained what, what had happened. And she had told me every day, but I couldn't form the memories. And it, finally it, it got so that the memories would take and I would retain things. And slowly but surely I, I uh, got better. I was put on a lot of different antibiotics and it was a big day when they took me and sat me up in a recliner. And it was a big day when I began to eat food again. And and it doesn't take long, take it from me, it doesn't take long for Ensure to get really old. And uh, so one day I asked my wife to order in a Godfather's pizza, so she did, and I could only eat about half a slice, but we gave the rest to the nurses and they appreciated it, I think. So after over a month in the hospital, I was able to walk out of there unassisted and went back home. And uh, after about a week at home, I began to resume farming. Uh, I remember the first time that I carried a salt block, I thought, when did they double this weight to 100 pounds? But laying around in a hospital bed has a way to uh, make you feel a little bit weak. And uh, after I'd been home about six weeks or so, I went back to my pulmonologist for a series of tests. And at that time, they said my pulmonary, my lung function was already back to within uh, the range of normal. Now, the only thing that I can really complain about is that after I got home, I noticed my peripheral vision wasn't what it used to be. And after I discussed it with the doctors and we went through some tests, they concluded that at one point my brain was so anoxic that uh, my, some vision cells in my brain were beginning to die and they likened it to damage from a stroke. So that's how close I was to death that I was, my brain was actually beginning to die. But I, I was able to resume farming and uh, I exited farming about 15 years ago and began to work for the Dairy Star. So I still get to go to dairy barns and still talk to dairy farmers. And uh, as often as I can, I discuss this issue with them. And, and like they showed in the survey, there are many, many people who know people that have gone through something similar like this. So 
I want to thank you again for this opportunity and, and uh, I hope that a lot of people take this message to heart.